Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. I'm Vlad Marinkas, the CEO of uh, Accurate. We are a Romanian startup in the field of um, personalization, which is also the, the topic of today. This is my first time in Athens, and I'm super excited. You have a very lively, uh, interesting city. I know it's late. I know it's Saturday. Uh, I hope you had a coffee, and I hope you still have some energy left, because we have a really interesting topic to talk about, namely personalization. So when I say personalization, I mean uh, um, a way of showing the right product to the right person at the right time. Okay, now I have also the pointer. Let's check if it works. Opa, opa, it works, but it's the last slide. So can we maybe please rewind and start from the... Yes, so personalization. So th this is an important topic today, right? Why? Because our customers expect us to know what they want because we have all this data and we have all these cool models and we're talking about AI. So they're expecting us to give them what they want and it kind of makes sense, right? So today we will talk about uh, how these models work, what we can do with them, also from a practical perspective. Uh, and, but first we will talk a bit about the context of how personalization has appeared and how it has de developed over the last years. So if we think about it, many of the big tech firms at their core they have a personalization engine. If you're thinking about Google, whenever you're searching something on Google and you have the query, what Google um, gives you as a result is uh, specifically personally tailor-made for you, right? So we have the SEO, of course, and we have some common elements, but at the end of the day, if you look at the whole query, everything is personalized. So if I'm searching for something and you're searching for something, we will get different results. The same Facebook, right? On Facebook, it matters a lot what kind of content you're engaging with. So whatever you like, whatever you share, depending on that, what you get in the feed is tailor-made for you. Amazon. Amazon has pioneered this space in e-commerce for 25 years now. So we're not talking about some latest technology. Of course, many of the, especially the big players are using it, but Amazon has started working on personalization engines 25 years ago. And we also have Netflix, who we all know. Um, and I'm also going to tell you a, bit, a small story about Netflix, of how they started, which at their core, they have also a personalization engine, right? Netflix wants to know what you want, what you want to like, to, to watch, as a movie, as a TV series, it doesn't matter. So I don't know if you know their story. They started in 2003, 2004, they were still a corner shop, they were renting DVDs. And then at some point, uh, it got really interesting because the streaming technology got available and they said, okay, this is great, wait a second, we have a good idea. Let's move into online. And then they had the tons of movies, they had a lot of content and they had tons of users, but their problem was, okay, how do we show the right movie to the right customer? And they knew this is a critical part and they didn't have the knowledge in house to develop it. So then they started a uh, $1 million price. They said, okay, we give them a data set, we invite whatever teams wants to join, the team that wins will get $1 million. And this is what happened in 2007 and 2008, and I think there were some professors from Harvard that won the prize. Uh, funny story, or maybe sad story, the model that was developed for Netflix at the time didn't get to go into production because the costs were too high. They switched, they managed to, to find a different model, and we know Netflix as we know it today. So personalization is a core part of all the big tech companies. If we're thinking about why this is, we mainly have two vectors of growth. So the first point is data, right? Today, we generate considerably more data. Google Analytics knows everything what you're doing on the website. We have the mobile phones. On the mobile phones, they also generate a lot of data. If you're thinking about the smartwatch, the smartwatch knows our temperature, it knows our heartbeat, everything, right? So we're generating more data. And this is, this is an important part of the success of personalization. And the second one, technology. And when I say technology, I don't necessarily mean the AI models. So probably most of you have heard about neural networks. It sounds sexy. These models have been around for since the 50s, so it's quite a while. The jump in technology that has allowed us today to do the personalization stems mostly 
from the computational increase in, in technology. So the fact that we have cheap cloud and we have a lot of resources so that we can compute the data. So these are the two important factors that led to the personalization that we see today. If we are moving slowly towards our sphere of e-commerce, the way that we do personalization, so that we enact personalization in e-commerce, is through recommender systems. Recommender systems, uh, everyone knows probably about AI and about generative AI, LLMs, right, chat GPT. Recommender systems are a different branch of AI models. So recommender systems, their focus, their objective, is to put all the data that you have about customers in and find a, a scoring, a match, between users and items. So this is, this is what we want. Right? So we will let an AI model do the job for us. In order to do so, we need two ingredients. The first one, as we, uh, as we discussed, is the data. The good part about the data in e-commerce is that if you're a shop, you own it. It's yours. So whatever platform you're in, you have data about who's buying, what's buying, and so on and so forth. So the data, you can check. The next ingredient is the machine learning part, right? You need a technology that can find the patterns in this data. Because in the data, whether you know it, whether you don't know it, whether you like it or not, there are patterns. So whatever you're selling, it could be that the recurrency is higher, or it could be that the recurrency is lower. But there are selling patterns in your e-commerce data. So then we come to the machine learning part, we come to the model. We will talk briefly about the concepts of how this machine learning model works. Uh, if you're interested, I'm very happy to discuss the details, the execution, more uh, nerdy stuff, let's say, because we will just talk about the concepts, but there are different models of how you can do it, factorization machines, neural networks, and so on and so forth. And after we have these two ingredients, and we will see that, okay, together we get the recommendations for the user, we will see also what we can do with them, because that's the critical part. You can have the best data in the world, you can have the best model in the world, you get the best recommendations. If you don't manage to go and, and connect to the uh, user at the end, it's for nothing, right? Okay, let's start with the data. What data is relevant for us in order to do personalization? we have two important sources. The first one are the user interactions. So basically, the model looks at what users do on the website, whether they're watching a, pro, uh, a specific product, whether they're adding to cart, or they're, uh, or they're adding to a wish list, or they're buying. It's a spectrum, basically, that tells us something, or tells the model something about the preferences of the user. This is the first part. The second part of the data that's relevant for good recommendations, as you can see also in the, uh, on the presentation, the display name, right? So the generic uh, information about the product, description, price, the category is very important if we want to play with the recommendations with cross-seller alternatives. And of course, the stock. We don't want to shoot ourselves in the leg. If we don't have a stock for the item, we don't want to recommend it to the customer, right? So this would be the data part. Moving on to the models. As a principle, for these uh, recommender systems, there are two important branches. The first one is collaborative filtering. Like the name says it, it's based on the collaboration between users and items. So it's based on the interaction between users and items. Let me give you a brief oversimplified example. Let's say a user comes and they buy a watch, a dress, and a perfume. And then the next user comes in and buys a watch, a dress, and a perfume. The third user will buy a watch and a dress. What will they get as a recommendation? A perfume, right? This is the pattern. This is the pattern that the model can pick up, and this is the recommendation that the model will do. Two important things to notice here. So the first one, this model can pick up trends in the market. If you're on the website, for some reason, some items started to, to get bundled and they started to get to, to be sold together, the model can pick that up and can put it in the recommendation. So it can quickly adapt and react to what's going on on your website. The second one, you might think, so if you're looking at the perfume, uh, you might think that it's counterintuitive, right? Why, why would you give someone a recommendation if they bought a watch and a dress of perfume? But that's the beauty. That's not a problem, even if it's counterintuitive. What you want to do 
is to give the customer what they ask and what the markets want. So this would be, let's say, the first type of models. And then we have the, sep the second time, content-based filtering, which, again, as the name mentions it, is based on the content of the product. So again, in an uh, example, if we're selling a blue sports bra, we can give a as a recommendation, because it's a bra, we can give other bras of different colors. Or maybe the user likes something with the color blue, and then we will recommend other items based on this color. So it's strictly based on the attributes of that specific items. These are the two types. Generally, what we see in production and how things are really happening is that you have a mix between them, because each of them has advantages and disadvantages. Okay, we had the data, we have the model, we calculated the recommendations. What do we do now? So, what you can see on the, uh, on the slide are a list of channels of how you can reach the customer. From what we have seen, and also intuitively what you probably might think makes sense, the most important channel is the product detail page. So, we're on the, on the product detail page, that's the point where we can propose something that's personalized for the user. The next channels are the category page, home page, check, uh, checkout cart. So this would be like the main four channels on the website, let's say. Email is an important channel, especially for post-purchase recommendations, right? The user was on the website, they bought something, the model knows what the user has bought, the model knows what other users have bought similarly, and then in one or two or three days, you can automatically send an email, hi, you bought the wine, do you want the candles? Maybe this is not the best example because you should have had both the wine and candles at the date uh, in the first place, but uh, you get the point. Other possible um, uh, channels are pop-up, app, push notification, SMS, WhatsApp, so basically whatever channel you have to your customers that can be used. After we have the channels, if we want to do the, and, and uh, implement the personalization, of course we need some goals. We have to think about what's our initial problem that we're trying to solve. And here, what you can see on the slide are the four main goals, let's say, of what we would need usually for personalization. So the first one is product discovery. We think that our, on our website, the clients are struggling to find what they want. Okay, how can we measure this? We can measure this through an improved conversion rate, right? If we put the recommendation engine and we have an increase in conversion rate, arguably, they can find things better. That's one goal. The second one, the basket size. We know that we have a good offer on our website, but it seems like the users or the clients are not buying many from our products. How can we measure that? An increase in average order value. So if the model does what it should do, we should see an increase there, right? The third one, promote specific items. You could have some specific business goals, get rid of some stock or whatever business goals you would like. You can also use it for that. And then, of course, you have some specific metrics. And loyalization, which is a bit tougher to measure, right? It's an indirect effect. But nevertheless, you can measure it based on the customer lifetime value. Our colleague was presenting it here uh, uh, in a previous uh, presentation. So these are four, let's say, important goals that, can, um, that you can use uh, for the personalization part. This is a matrix. If you look at the top, so the tables are these goals, conversion rate, average order value, customer lifetime value. And uh, on the left hand side, on the rows, this, this is your real estate. This is, these are your resources that you have available on your website. And based on these resources, you can play around to use it as a toolbox so that, let's say, if you have a problem, you want to increase the customer lifetime value. What can you do? OK, you go on the home page. You put some recommendations, new in store. Of course, new in store, this is not AI heavy. There are recommendations that are more AI heavy or less, but this is uh, an example of what you can do to achieve this goal. Recently bought, if you have a user that has, that has a high recurrence or he has bought something recently, you can know or the model can know on the home page when the user uh, ends up on the home page based on the cookie, the model knows um, their past history, right? And it can propose directly there personalized recommendations. And of course, in the email, what I was uh, telling you about previously, um, uh, the post-purchase recommendations. So this is just one example, but you can play around with the goals and the real estate and the types of recommendations so that you can achieve the goals. 
this is how it also looks like practically. So this uh, uh, this is a product detail page, right? We're selling laptops. What can we do? We introduce two widgets. One of them, as you can see, is for alternative products. Maybe the customer has not chosen the laptop yet. So what you can do is to provide recommendations tailor-made for him that takes into account his past history and also other users' history with similar laptops. So the first widget that you see is our alternative products. The second one, Crossel. Maybe he has already, he knows what he's going to buy and you can offer him a mouse, keypad or whatever you want as a cross-sell to increase the average order value. Another channel is the checkout page recommendations. Um, so of course this is at a point where the customer has already decided, okay, I want to buy this item and then you want to increase your average order value. This is a bit trickier, so you have to be careful here. If the customer is already at the checkout, you don't maybe want to recommend him items that are cheaper or alternatives because that way you're getting him back into the cycle, into the buying cycle. So that's why if the customer is on the checkout page, in terms of recommendations, you will be recommending him cross-sell. So you bought the laptop, here's a mouse. You bought the laptop, here's the keyboard or headset or whatever. Homepage recommendations. On the homepage, it depends a lot on how the user got there, right? Because it may be that they got directly through the website or organically, they end up on the homepage. You don't know much about him. You can give him some basic things like new uh, items or best sellers so that you can get more information about his behavior and so that you can get him better recommendations afterwards. Category recommendations, they get more and more important. This is here an example of a widget. If you have categories that have a lot of items, so it depends a lot on your structure of categories, it's worthwhile to put a widget there and start maybe from bestsellers, that's something not personalized, up to some really personalized recommendations so that you increase your chances of selling because they don't have always the users the bandwidth of scrolling through all of, the, all of your ca uh, specific category page. Of course, we shouldn't uh, forget about mobile. Uh, probably it's the same uh, in Greece. 80-85% of the uh, traffic and of the orders are done uh, through mobile, more or less. Okay, so it's the same in Romania. This is where we're from. That's where we have the, the info. Uh, based on that, of course, we have to be careful that you, we don't have enough space to put maybe four items in the recommendations or three. So we have to be careful with how we design the widgets and what we choose there. As mentioned, this would be an example of how email recommendations would look like. You know that the user has bought them. After a while, you send them the recommendations with some complementary products. Merchandising rule is something that I wanted to present to you. This is, so we talked about AI, about how cool the models are, what they can do. But oftentimes, they may be, lack, may be lacking some information or we would like to promote some specific business goals besides the usual default ones. So that would mean that we have the default model as an AI model. It does the cross-sell, it does upsell, it does alternative products and all the recommendations. And we say, okay, but I want to prioritize specific brands. We can do that. So we can do an interplay between the, what the AI model gives as a default and our own business uh, uh, rules. Another example, get aligned with active campaigns. We have a campaign on a specific item, on a specific brand, on a specific category. We can tune that also with the recommender system. Take in mind that the recommenders, the recommend, these recommendation engines work as a second part of the funnel. So your first problem, right, is to bring the customer on the website, and for that you're paying a lot of money on ads and whatever other um, uh, channels, and then the, the recommendation system enters in the second phase, where it would be a pity after you have invested so much in bringing the customer to the website not to provide him with the best uh, content there. So that would be, let's say, an add-on. In terms of numbers, uh, what I'm presenting here, these are numbers from, from our customers. We get a two times higher uh, user engagement, plus 19% of conversion rate, plus 16% of average order value, and plus 23% of net revenue. So these are numbers that we got with our customers. Uh, I invite you not to believe these numbers. I invite you to test. So if there are two takeaways from my talk today, the first one would be test, because nowadays the barrier is so low 
there are a lot of tools like what we are doing, we're offering 30 day free trial. There are also other tools that are offering free trials or cheap prices. So it's really worthwhile to test because if you, let's say on the product page, product detail page, if you don't have anything in terms of recommended for you or others have also bought, I can guarantee you that you're losing money. So the first step would be to use maybe something that's like free from the platform, whatever uh, e-commerce platforms you're on, and then check more complex tools, AI-based, to see and check the results. It's uh, uh, also in terms of the pricing, you can find flexibility. There are many tools out there. Our tools is based on orders. Other tools are based on the amount of traffic that you have. So uh, the first takeaway, just uh, test it. The second takeaway, test it now. This is uh, so. This is the best time. If we're looking at the market, so uh, in Romania it's similar, let's say, to Greece. We're also active in the German market. In the German market, everyone uses something, S something in this regard, so for the recommender system. So it's not a question of if, it's a question of when, because you have the data and it's easy to, to take advantage of this tool. And already in Greece, I'm sure that the bigger players are using it. So you have the data, why shouldn't you be using it? So these are, this is the, uh, the, these are the two points that I would like to, to leave you with. Um, I would uh, like to thank you a lot for your attention today. I'm very happy to, to take uh, answers, uh, sorry, questions. Uh, but but the, you can take answers as well. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, either or. And I would also like to invite everyone, if you have uh, additional questions to our booth, uh, Accurate, together with our partners from 3DS, we're more than happy to, to talk about this, uh, this type of tools. Thanks a lot. The applause is because you managed to even... Sorry? You managed the pressure that I gave you. Okay, okay that, so that sounds good. Yeah, truly. <laughs>